Madison's words an example and Burke's words an example are as pertinent in our time as they were in their own. Today's conservatives should heed them as they come to grips with two entrenched realities that pose genuine challenges to liberty and whose prudent management is critical to the nation's well-being. The first entrenched reality, forgive me for saying this, is that the era of big government is here to stay. This is particularly important for libertarians to absorb. Over the last 200 years, society and the economy in advanced industrial nations have undergone dramatic transformations, and for three quarters of a century, the New Deal settlement has been reshaping Americans' expectations about the nation state's reach and role. <clears throat> Consequently, the U.S. federal government will continue to provide a social safety net, regulate the economy, and shoulder a substantial share of responsibility for safeguarding the social and economic bases of political equality. All signs are that a significant majority of Americans will want it to continue to do so. In these circumstances, conservatives must redouble, redouble their efforts to reform sloppy and incompetent government and to resist government's inherent expansionist tendencies and progress progressivism's reflexive leveling proclivities. But the attempt in today's circumstances to dismantle or even substantially roll back the welfare and regulatory state reflects a distinctly unconservative refusal to ground political goals and political realities. Can, conservatives can and should focus on restraining spending, reducing regulation, reforming the tax code, and generally reining in our sprawling federal government. But conservatives should retire misleading talk of small government. Instead, they should think and speak in terms of limited government. The second entrenched reality, this one test, testing social conservatives, is the sexual revolution, perhaps the greatest social revolution in human history. The invention and popularization in the mid-1960s of the birth control pill, a cheap, convenient, and effective way to, pre to prevent pregnancy, was momentous. It meant for the first time in human history, women could reliably control reproduction. This, this greatly enhanced their ability to enter the workforce and pursue careers. It also transformed romance, reshaped the structure of the family, and refashioned marriage. It's still doing so. Brides may still wed in virginal white. Couples may still promise to love and cherish, for better and for worse, until death do them part. And children, or a child, may still lie in the future for most married couples. Nevertheless, 90% of Americans engage in premarital, premarital sex. Cohabitation before marriage is common. <clears throat> out-of-wedlock births are substantial. Divorce, while emotionally searing, is no longer unusual, legally difficult, or socially stigmatizing. Children, once the core reason for getting married, married have become optional. And civil unions for gays and lesbians have acquired majority support, while same-sex marriage is not far behind. These profoundly transformed circumstances do not oblige social conservatives to alter their fundamental convictions. Social conservatives should continue to make the case for the traditional understanding of marriage with children at the center, both for its intrinsic human rewards and for the benefits a married father and mother bring to rearing children. And conservatives should back family-friendly public policy and they should seek within the democratic process to persuade fellow citizens to adopt socially conservative views and vote for candidates devoted to them. But given the enormous changes over the last 50 years, in the United States and the way individuals understand and experience romance marriage in the family. And with a view to the enduring imperatives of limited government, social conservatives should refrain from using the federal government to enforce the traditional understanding of sex marriage in the family. Social conservatives can remain true to their principles about sex marriage in the family even as they adjust their expectations of what can be achieved through democratic politics. And they can remain true to their principles as they renew their appreciation of the limits that American constitutional government imposes on regulating fellow citizens' conduct of their private lives. Some conservatives worry that giving any ground, sometimes in regard to the welfare and regulatory state, sometimes in regard to the sexual revolution, sometimes in regard to both, is tantamount 
to sanctifying a progressive status quo. That's to mistake a danger for a destiny. Seeing circumstances as they are is a precondition for preserving one's principles and effectively translating them into viable reforms. <coughs> Even under the shadow of big government and in the wake of the sexual revolution, both libertarians and social conservatives can preserve their most deeply held beliefs. They can affirm together the dignity of the person, the, inseparable, the inseparability of human dignity from individual freedom and self-government, the dependence of individual freedom and self-government on a thriving civil society, and the paramount importance the Constitution places on maintaining a political framework that secures liberty by limiting government. Confusion persists in many quarters about what a return to the Constitution entails. Some hard-driving conservatives see such an undertaking as an opportunity to restore simplicity and purity to American politics. Influential progressive politicians and pundits have tried to portray a return to the Constitution as a reactionary grasping after an imagined past. Both opinions are at odds with the balancing and blending at the heart of a constitutional conservatism, at least a constitutional conservatism that takes its bearings, say, by Burke, the Federalist, and the high points of post-World War II American conservatism. What is a constitutional conservatism? Very briefly, constitutional conservatism or constitutional well conservatism well understood puts liberty first, and it teaches that political moderation is indispensable in securing, preserving, and extending liberty's blessings. The American Constitution it seeks to conserve presupposes natural freedom and equality. The Constitution draws legitimacy both from democratic consent and from the protection of individual rights. The Constitution limits and enumerates government's powers while providing government the incentives and tools to discharge its responsibilities effectively. It reflects and refines popular will through a complex scheme of representation. It provides checks and balances by dispersing and blending power among three distinct branches of the federal government as well as among, as between the federal and the state government. It assumes, the Constitution does, the primacy of self-interest but also the capacity of and necessity for citizens to rise above it through the exercise of virtue. The Constitution welcomes a diver diverse array of voluntary associations as an expression of liberty to prevent anyone from dominating and because they serve as schools for the virtues of freedom. And the Constitution recognizes the special roles of families and religious faith in cultivating these virtues. Constitutional conservatism, well understood, does not mandate particular policies or command specific laws, but it does bring into focus the overarching aims and larger considerations that in a free society should inform policy and underlie law. To be sure, Honoring the imperatives of constitutional conservatism will require both social conservatives and libertarians to bite their fair share of bullets as they translate principles into law and policy. But conservatives will work from a position of strength as they accommodate balance and calibrate in behalf of the individual freedom on which the highest political hopes of both depend. That strength derives from the lesson of moderation inscribed in constitutional conservatism, well understood. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists. I, um, we're, we're running a little late. I do want to get some uh, uh, questions uh, on the floor. Um, I, uh, I found uh, all of the talks very interesting. Um, Peter's the, the most uh, provocative. I, um, uh, I hope someone might um, think of quoting Bill Buckley's uh, comment from that first issue of National Review about the ambition of conservatives being to stand athwart history uh, yelling stop, which sounds, uh, I think sounds a, a somewhat different, in fact, a very different note from, from yours. I, um, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the economist Her Herbert Stein once said that that which cannot go on forever won't. And, um, uh, I just wonder whether this welfare 
behemoth that you described that we should make our peace with um, can go on forever, uh, and whether conservatives can uh, make their peace with it. I understand the qualifications you've had, but um, I'm going to stop, and I want to turn the microphone over to uh, the other. Is there something that uh, we can draw uh, from uh, Whitaker Chambers and also from Bill Buckley, particularly in view of what Peter has just said, which is a, a brilliant presentation. I hope that we'll be able to get copies of it and think about it and talk about it and debate it for some time to come. You have Bill Buckley, the idealist, and Whitaker Chambers, the realist. And I base this upon a letter that uh, Chambers wrote to, to Bill, to Bill Buckley, in which he said he preferred the Chesterfield option, the Chesterfield option, uh, dealing with the idea of prudence and moderation. And really, to put it in your terms, Peter, this really would be Burkean, uh, the Burkean thing. The challenge, this is a paraphrase, I was trying to get the right words, but this is a pretty good paraphrase, I think, hopefully. The challenge, said Chambers to Buckley, the challenge is how much to give up to attain a political policy or goal, and how much not to give up to preserve an essential principle. And that's that constant debate which we're always going about. Um, well, briefly, I, uh, I think that's right. It's a constant challenge, every day anew, figure it out. Um, br briefly, in response to, uh, to Roger, um, yes, for sure, uh, conservative in the Bill Buckley spirit uh, says to history, stop. But when history doesn't obey, uh, that has to be taken into account. Um, and in many respects, history has refused to obey, and my uh, exhortation is uh, not, that, uh, not that there is not an absolutely indispensable role uh, for conservatives who, s who continue to say to history to stop, but there's also a role in recognizing that it hasn't and take it, taking those developments into account. Does I'll slowing it down a little bit count? So slowing it, slowing it down is, is actually what I was advocating, mm -hmm. what I was advocating. In other words, the m aggressive, principled reform, far as you can go, but in, in practical terms, uh, a, a dream of, which I still sometimes hear the language, a dream of small government really is a fantasy. But, it, but that doesn't prevent us from returning to what's best about our founding. Because the founding principles, remember, were not founding principles about small government. In fact, if you'll recall, the Federalist Papers, the Constitution, was on the side of large government. It was the anti-Federalists who said, you're creating a behemoth that will swallow everything up. They wanted a more powerful government. However, they were acutely aware. What did they all agree on? This powerful government had to be limited aggressively, out of principle, to protect liberty. So uh, I couldn't be more in favor, it's where I began, with aggressively limiting government in accordance with our founding principles. I, I want to, what I want to avoid is getting lost in a debate over small government that, lead, in my opinion, uh, leads nowhere valuable. We can also always ask how much worse it would be if we weren't doing what we're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. 